I want to tell you a little bit about SVB in general. Um, we, are a, we are principally a, a financial institution, institution for startup companies. Anybody who's in the innovation ecosystem is very interesting to us. And that could be the startup companies themselves, their investors, um, it could be budding entrepreneurs. It's the, the, whole, the whole mix is very interesting to us. And so, um, you know, we bank about, about uh, two thirds of, of um, uh, we bank about 50% of VC backed companies um, out in the, in the US. We also um, are broken up across several different divisions. So we are principally, I would say our principal focus is, is tech, is very tech centric, um, but we also have a, a a big and probably and most and fast growing life science team that covers pharma and biotech. We have a clean energy and, 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 um, and energy technology practice and we also bank VC funds themselves, VC firms and VC funds themselves. Um, we are, uh, the, the, one of the most fun parts of the business is our premium wine business. Actually we have, um, we bank wineries. We are heavily invested in, in uh, all up and down sort of Napa and Sonoma um, and um, and we like to drink wine a lot. Um, we are a, a, what I would call sort of, the, sort of characterized SVB as a, a, uh, a very big small bank, right? So we have about $38 billion in assets. Um, we have 13 billion in loans outstanding. So, uh, and we're, um, and 65 billion in, in client funds. We're, we were, we're consistently ranked as one of the top performing banks in the country. Um, principally because we know this space so well and we, we bank those companies very cleverly and we, um, and we try to provide a rich enough ecosystem so that most of our clients stick with us as the companies mature and eventually go public and even after that. So. We're also over the, all over the world, right? So we have, as, if you think about where, wherever there's a major venture ecosystem in the US for sure and, then, and, now, and now really abroad, we have a presence, right? So we have, we have offices um, all over the Bay Area, as you might imagine, but then we're also in places like Austin, Texas, Boulder, Portland, um, you know, New York, Boston, and so forth. So, so we like to, uh, we follow entrepreneurs and, um, and, and, their, and their investors all over. Um, <clears throat> SV Analytics um, is, is uh, my, my group in SV Analytics, um, is a, is a really interesting story here. We, we actually started in 2006 to solve a really kind of, um, kind of uh, esoteric problem that startups have. They, when startups want to issue stock to their employees, a lot of startups do that because they don't have a lot of cash necessarily to spend, so they, they issue stock to their employees. Um, they have to figure out how to price that stock and, and do so in accordance with a lot of the IRS and the SEC and, and auditors and all this sort of stuff. So we started, we started this business to actually solve this problem for startups. And then over time, we realized that we were collecting a wealth of information about startups and how they were financed and what kept our entrepreneurs up at night. You know, how much are entrepreneurs giving up uh, when, they raise a, when they raise a venture round? And, and this, this information that we were collecting um, is actually perhaps the most interesting part of, that, of, this whole, of this whole business. And what we started to do was, was layer in other pieces to this where we were like data and research services. Um, and things like uh, what we're, our, new, our new area that we're pushing into now is strategic advisory services. So if you're a company uh, like a Microsoft or, or a, a Google and you're interested in, um, in buying target companies within a particular space, we would be able to help with that. And that's, that's one of the things that we're doing, sort of smaller, sort of very strategic buy-side M&A work. And that's, that's uh, some additional aspects of what we do. Um, we, we have a, um, our, I would say our valuation practice is still sort of our day-to-day, our, -day, our sort of bread and butter. We, we do about 1,000 valuation engagements a year. Um, we have a team of about 50 here in the States and about 50 folks at our offshore partner um, in, in India. Um, here are some examples of some of the folks we've worked with, some of the, some of the, some of the big guys, um, you know, uh, Boeing, Microsoft, Citi, we've also, some of the sort of household names on the startup landscape are clients of ours, and, and we're very proud of that. Um, the makeup of, the, of, our, of our client base is, is actually relevant for sort of the rest of the presentation, because this sort of shows that we are 
um, we're very, as I said, we're very tech-centric, and within tech, we're very software-centric. So most of the, the, the information that we're gonna be talking about today is, it's about sort of soft tech software companies. This is, this is a, this is a very, so, you know, while we do have um, information on med device companies and, and, uh, and pharma companies and so forth, it's gonna be a very tech software heavy, heavy discussion today. Um, just before we move on, just wanna kinda of get a, a read of the room. How many folks in here are um, investors or have invested in startups before? Okay. And how many folks in here are, have raised, uh, are, are entrepreneurs who have raised an institutional round of venture capital? Okay. And how many folks in here plan to or might eventually? Okay. All right. So, um, so that, that helps with the, uh, with sort of the framing this discussion. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about valuing your company, sort of when to value your company, um, who typically would value a company and why, um, and how often. We're gonna talk a little bit about the economic rights of preferred equity. So when venture investors invest in your company, they take preferred shares. Those preferred shares are preferred for a reason, and a lot of that is, has to do with the economic rights that come along with those preferred shares. And, and, and we wanna talk a little bit about the impact that, that can have on you all, the entrepreneurs, if there's an exciting you know, M&A event later on or, or an IPO event uh, at some point in the future. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the trends in private company valuations that we're seeing and, and how that can sort of uh, help inform folks who are maybe uh, in the fundraising process. Um, uh, think about, okay, well wait, if I'm, if I'm a series, if I'm, a, if I'm, a, if I'm seeking my seed, my seed round, how much should I think about, how much of, my, of the company should I expect to have to give up if I raise a certain amount of capital? And, and things like that. So we'll talk a little about that. And then determining equity compensation. This is gonna, we're gonna go through that part pretty, quick, pretty quickly. It's actually a, um, just to kind of give you a glimpse of what a fully funded, how much ownership some of the senior folks usually own when a company has been fully funded. So in valuing your company, um, you know, there's, there's, you can think of, um, you can think of valuation happening at really kind of, yes, excuse me. Yes. Are you able to share your best? I absolutely will. Thank is it hard to see? Is it hard to see? No, no, it's fine, but I was going to say, just go here and take the picture. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I absolutely, we'll, we'll be sharing the deck. Perfect. So, everybody exits. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> so um, the, you can think of the, um, of the of valuations as happening kind of at two bookends. Um, right in the very beginning, um, is, you know, one of your most important valuations is sort of how you're, how you're setting things up. And typically that's when your venture investors or your other institutional investors come in and, and work with you and negotiate what they think the valuation of your company is versus what you do and you sort of land in the middle as in the negotiation or land somewhere in there in any, as in the, in the negotiation. Um, and there's a lot of, this is, you know, obviously a lot more art than science at this stage, right? Um, as the company matures and you're at the end of the sort of the, 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 the company's uh, life as a privately held company, um, that's typically when you would have, you're seeking an exit event and that's typically when investment bankers would come in um, and a lot, a lot, it's still a lot of art but, but much more science at that, at that stage. And so the institutional investor, the investment bankers, excuse me, are, are um, working with you, working with the senior management to actually set the price of the company um, in the case of an IPO, it's, it's, they're going to be working with institutional investors to figure out what the market, the right, the right price that the market should open at for that com particular company. Um, and, um, and then in between these two points are, obviously there's gonna be, there's most, for most uh, startups, there's gonna be more than one round of venture capital uh, or other infusion of capital before, before the company sort of uh, hits a stable, stable, um, ca stable cash flow break even. Um, so there's going to be additional times when VCs come in and, and revalue the company. And, and what you're seeing now is that um, what you're seeing now is that some mega companies, some some startups that are obviously quite large and and, and obviously very well known, the so-called unicorn set, many of those many of those companies are actually bypassing the IPO step, uh, at least for the time being. And they're raising money from private investors. Most of them are actually institutional investors and would be IPO investors, but they're maintaining, um, they're, they are investing um, still as a privately held company. 
to get some of these, com these, these big companies to the point where they're actually much even more attractive to, pri to, uh, to public markets later on, right? So think the Ubers of the world and the Airbnbs and so forth, right? So um, in between these, these, these bookend points, uh, often startups will, will need to value their company for, um, for compliance reasons, for tax purposes. And that's typically where some, a group like us would come in and help appraise the business so that you can issue stock to your employees and do so in a way that's, um, that optimizes that, that for, for everybody in, involved. Any questions on this? Um, so how often should, we, should, should people should we think about getting an independent valuation? We typically would recommend doing that once a year. Um, starting at the point where you've actually, uh, you've raised your first institutional, institutional round or you've raised you know, upwards of a um, million dollars. Let's say you've raised a million dollars from friends and family, right? If you've start, once you start to tip across uh, near that million dollar mark, um, you should start thinking about having an appraisal, especially if you're gonna be doing, um, if you're gonna be issuing stock. Um, we typically recommend doing it once a year, um, and or, or doing it sooner if you actually have an event that happens, a material event where, you know, the positive or negative, that could impact um, what investors might think about your company at that point in time. So, you know, if you have a situation where you win a uh, several key cu customers that you've been working on for a long time, and it's going to materially change your um, your your revenue picture, that's something you would want to just check in on um, before you issue stock to your employees. The main reason is you don't want to issue stock to your employees um, that's cheap. It's that's so cheap that it's actually going to be in violation of the IRS. Um, cheap stock is, is essentially when you issue stock options to your employees at below fair market value. So think of, you know, your fair market value for your, for your company's stock is 50 cents a share, and you issue stock to your employees at 10 cents a share. That's a, that can create a major tax problem for your employees, which can also come back to you and the board later on. So, um, and we kind of covered material event, but like I said, um, you know, the biggest material event of all, at least while you're privately held, is when there's a financing event, right? So it's definitely time to, to look into it at that point. So we'll talk a little bit about economic rights here. Um, for, folks who have, um, for folks who have raised institutional capital, you might, be, you might be familiar with a term sheet and some of the terms in the term sheet. You might have worked with your, your uh, counsel, your attorney, to to help you think about, you know, what's gonna impact me? Is this gonna impact me adversely or not? Um, what I wanna do is focus on a few here that can, that can have the biggest impact, so that if you do find yourself with, uh, in the, good, in the uh, good fortune of, of receiving a term sheet, you can actually have some of this in, in mind and, and know some of the right questions to ask about it. So a few of the key terms that, we, that kind of we're gonna be bandied about a fair amount are things like pre-money and post-money. Um, pre-money is simply the value of your company before, before someone in, um, places, invests money in your company. Um, post-money is, is simply the pre-money plus that investment amount. Um, uh, the, a liquidation preference, you'll hear a liquidation preference used a fair amount. Um, liquidation preference is actually the amount of money that, is, that, is, um, that has been invested by investors in aggregate in your company over time, and that it, that amount of money sits before sits um, at the top of the what they call the waterfall. So it's actually payable before anybody at the common any common shareholders receive receive value. So if you're an entrepreneur and you've raised twenty million dollars in venture capital, um, the the venture investors that invested that twenty million dollars are entitled to get that twenty million dollars back before the entrepreneurs and the, and the employees and everybody else receive, receive their payout. Unless the exit's so big that they convert their shares to common, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and they receive um, uh, a different amount. So seniority is just the order in which preferred, the preferred investors are paid out. Um, you know, this can be, this can, uh, usually it's the last investors in are paid at first and then going to back down the line. Um, participation rights. This is, where we're gonna spend a, a, a decent amount of time talking about this. This is actually where preferred investors actually get to um, receive their liquidation preference, the, the amount that they invested, but they also get to pretend as though they had converted their shares to common. 
So they get to kind of play both sides. They get to have their cake and eat it too. And we'll walk through some examples of how that actually plays out and why it's important to be on the lookout for participation rights when you're, when you're fundraising. Um, dividends are, as you might imagine, these are essentially almost like interest um, on, the, uh, on the amount that's been invested in the company. And anti-dilution rights are, are ways that uh, are protect, it's a protective feature so that early investors are not penalized if, if, if you go out and raise money in a subsequent round at a lower valuation than happened than, than they invested in. So if you raise money at a valuation of you know, $15 million and you subsequently think you know, the, the economy changes or the, uh, the business changes and you go out to raise new money at $10 million, uh, at a $10 million valuation, that can actually, the folks who hold anti-dilution protection can, um, are entitled to receive additional shares to keep them whole. And so it can be very, very dilutive to the common shareholders, to the, to the management and the employees when that happens. Um, we actually don't see, the good news about some of the stuff is that we actually see in, in, in up cycles like we're in now, we actually see a lot of these onerous rights um, start to fade um, compared to down cycles, right? So in the wake of 2008, the 2008 crisis, the term sheets that were coming out in, in the wake of 2008 crisis were, were, were very, were, were pretty gnarly, right? And then they got much better as the economy improved and the supply of capital expanded and so forth. Um, and so, so you might not see a lot of this, especially on the coasts, right? Um, but uh, but you still, we still see it occasionally in smaller markets or um, in, in, in areas where there's, not a, there's, there's less capital available and, um, and a different investor profile, risk profile. So, um, you know, the pre-money and post-money concept is, is, is fairly straightforward. Um, so, you know, it's your, your pre-money plus your invested, the amount that's invested is your post-money. Um, sometimes this, the pre-money valuation, when, when entrepreneurs are thinking about, okay, well, what am I worth, what am I worth today? Um, we don't have any revenue. We're, we don't necessarily have, um, you know, a massive customer base, but you know, how should we be, even be thinking about what we're worth uh, today? Um, what typic, what sometimes folks will do is say, Okay, well, how much am I, how much do I anticipate having to give up of my company when I go raise this $2 million? That, 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 that percent, that ownership percentage can actually be used to back into your implied pre-money valuation here. So if you're, if you're raising $2 million and the, the investors come up to you and say, or your advisors come to you and say, look, based on where you, where you are, you should expect to give up a third of your company uh, in exchange for that $2 million. Based on where you are and everything else, you can, you can uh, simply divide two by the 33 and then get to your, your post money and then simply back out the amount of, that's been invested and, um, and you're at your pre-money valuation. And that can kind of help, you can kind of use that. Um, and the reason I walk through this is because in a minute we're gonna be talking about what our data is, is telling us about this, about this ownership percentage, right? How much is typically given up? And so you guys can sort of think about, okay, well, I see where this is trending, and so this is kind of good to have in the back of my, in my back pocket. You know, when we talked about liquidation preference, we talked about that, this idea that the money, it's the money that's been invested um, in the company. Um, and, you know, in some cases, investors will require actually a multiple of that money. So if you, they invest $5 million, they might put a 2x liquidation preference on, a 2x multiple on that liquidation preference, meaning that they're going to want $10 million before anybody gets anything. So that's, so these, again, we don't see it, we haven't seen it a lot lately, um, but, uh, but, it, but it does happen, especially if, for, with distressed companies. So if you're in a very, if you're in a particularly disadvantaged position at the negotiating table is when you, is when you can um, start to see some of this surface. Um, participation right, we kind of talked about this already. Um, cap participation is actually a compromise between no participation rights and full participation rights. So typically entrepreneurs want a, when they go, they want a clean term sheet when they go to raise money. They want very plain, what they call sort of plain vanilla terms. They want no participation rights. They want no, um, no multiple on the liquidation preference. Uh, they want, uh, you know, no, you know, dividend, no dividends, or if there are dividends, they're not payable. They don't, they don't accrue. They're not necessarily payable. Um, 
And, and so that's a, that's a very sort of uh, entrepreneur-friendly term sheet, right? Obviously, an investor-friendly term sheet would have all these, a lot of these sweeteners, and, and, and including participation rights. Um, cap participation rights is where um, a, you know, a VC might say, look, I, you know, I want full, full participation rights. You want none. Let's cap our participation right at about at 2x or 3x or something of, of our original issuance price. And that's, that can be kind of a compromise. And so when do you see participation rights kind of rear their head? If entrepreneur, in our experience anyway, when we, when, when we see this, this layered in, is, and sometimes it can be layered in, obviously, if it's a, if it's a tough time for the company or the, uh, or the economy, but it can actually, even in a good environment, if the entrepreneur is digging their heels and saying, listen, my valuation is substantially, I believe my valuation is substantially higher than what you're willing to invest at, but let's, and so we're at this, we're almost at an impasse. Um, there are situations where VCs might say, okay, look, I'm willing to cede to you, so, you know, that your valuation's higher than, higher than I originally said, but you have to put some of the, you have to introduce some economics for me by layering in some type of participation right in here, so that as a sweetener, and as a sort of a, in a way, to compensate me for taking on some additional risk here, right? Because by 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 agreeing to in by agreeing to give you a higher valuation, I'm implicitly taking less ownership of the company, which means that I'm you know not going to make as much later on and so forth. Um, and so you can see that you can see that happen. I mean, you know, like I said, if you're once your your first call after you get a term sheet, if you haven't made the call already is to, your, is to an attorney, right, is to your lawyer. And those are the folks who can make sure that some of this stuff is, you know, that they, they're, they're summarizing what a lot of this stuff is for you um, and making sure that you're aware of, of some of the stuff that's maybe harder to find in the, in the legalese. So this is actually, um, I, I wanted to sort of to drive the point home on participation rights um, here just in, and, and how, the, in, how the participation rights can actually impact the, the amount that's available to the entrepreneurs and the company later, later on by using an example. So this is a company, a later stage company, <clears throat> that, um, that has raised, uh, that, that raised $35 million uh, in exchange for 20% of the company, right? This is not, the, by the way, this is just a sim simple example. That's actually not a normal, um, <laughs> that's not a normal, uh, <laughs> situation. Um, if you can do that, do it. <laughs> um, but, um, but anyway, so this is, uh, uh, by way of example, this is, uh, these, are, these are three different scenarios, right? Um, one where the exit value of the company is $50 million, one where it's 175 and one at 300. So, you know, kind of a low, mid, high case uh, exit for a, um, a company that, and again, these are, are, are these high exits um, in general? Um, you know, it's funny, I was having this discussion the other day with a friend who exited his business, but he exited, a, he, he sold his business for a mere $150 million. And there was no, and, and, and you know, we're, we're sitting on his, on his yacht, and no, I'm just kidding, we were, but, but, but no, but it was a, but we, we, were, we were sitting at a restaurant and he, he, said, he said, you know, um, he said, nobody talks about these exits right now. Nobody, these aren't even making much news because the only ones people are talking about are you know Instagram's measly one and a half billion dollar exit, right? And how undervalued it is now in hindsight and all this kind of stuff. So these guys aren't even making, but it, these are big exits, by the way. These are these are in my so I say low, medium, medium, and high. Um, I, I I just mean relative to each other, not <laughs> not in the overall grand scheme of things. Um, so it's a uh, um, so in this in this in this scenario, this is a fifty million dollar exit. The, the, the investor has the uh, has the choice, right? They they uh, and again, this is this these scenarios up here are straight liquidation preference, just a one x liquidation preference. This is a full participation right scenario, so like the most most onerous, right, of the of the scenarios. Um, in a fifty million dollar exit scenario, the investor has the right to either receive their thirty five million dollar <coughs> investment back in the form of the liquidation preference, or they get an emphasis or the the twenty percent of of the of the exit value, right? Well, obviously thirty five is greater than the twenty percent of the fifty, so thirty five is greater than the ten. So they'll they'll hold their liquidation preference. They're going to demand that they receive the liquidation preference first. Um, in this scenario, 
Um, I hope you guys can see it better than I can, and I'm standing right here in front of it. But um, so in this scenario, it's a um, they can receive 35 million dollars, or they get 20 percent of the 175, which is a push, right? This is a, this is the indifference point, um, and um, in this situation, you know they they stand to gain. Um, they stand to benefit equally. Um, in this scenario, obviously, anything above the 175, any exit above 175, they're going to convert their shares from preferred to common. They're going to receive their pro rata ownership, however much of the cap table they actually own at that point in time. So in this case, 20% of, of the 300 million. Um, so they stand, in this case, to get $60 million versus the 35 million. So you can see how um, how as exits get bigger, the likelihood of preferred shareholders converting their shares from preferred over to common increases, right? And when they convert their shares from preferred to common, they're giving up all of those preferred, those preferences, those, per, those participation rights, those dividends, any, any and all of that, they are going, are essentially getting wiped out. An IP, in an IPO event, an IPO event, that happens automatically. That's it's called auto conversion. That happens automatically when when the IPO happens, all of the preferred shares are all collapsed into the common shares and everybody's just, everybody's equal, right? Um, so a lot of these really big unicorns that are out there who are raising mega rounds of $150 million and so forth, they're banking on the fact that they're going to be able to I eventually IPO. Many of them are too big to be acquired, most would say. And so they're, gonna, they're, go they're banking on the fact that they're gonna be able to IPO and that when they do, they're gonna wipe out all of those those massive liquidation preferences on, along the way, right? In the, in the, in the, um, the full participation concept, this is again where they get their cake and eat it too, right? In each of these scenarios, they receive their liquidation preference, right? They always get their liquidation preference. Whatever they put in, they get that $35 million back, and they get their pro rata of what's available after, that's been, after that $35 million check has been cut to them, right? So they get their $35 million, right? Leaving, which, you know, so, and then whatever's left after the, after the $35 million um, gets paid on top. So in this case, you see 35 million here, or they get, or 38 million, 35 million or 63, 60 or 88. Participation rights can make a big difference, right? And particularly the bigger the exit. So it's, it's important to, um, to, to think about, because again, in, in in participation rights mean, basically mean that the investors don't actually have to convert their shares to common. There's no need to convert their shares to common because they get their pro rata anyway on top of it. So it's a, you know, if you, if you're, if you have an, if you have a, a company where, you know, your, your likely, your exit value, your target exits are in this, in somewhere in this range, right? If you're kind of being realistic, um, or I mean, um, then what ends up happening is, is that, um, if when you, when the, when it's time to cut checks, when it's time to take this $300 million and start passing it down the waterfall and doling checks out, the amount, the participation rights can really add up and sit, and they sit again in front of everybody else. So it's a, it can have a big impact on the, on the, the wealth of not only the founders, but also the rest of the, rest of the, of the team. Any questions on this before we jump? Because this is, yes. Um, so, so the last, the last investors in are the first ones to receive money. I, I, you know, it's, I don't know if it's just tradition or if it's mostly, it has some, if it's tied back to like, you know, a little bit of risk aversion, right? So the, the last investors that are in typically have a lower risk profile than the earlier investors. And so they're coming in, um, they're probably not, they're not going to come in necessarily at, they're going to come in at better terms, I guess more investor friendly terms. But, but, but they're still taking on some risk and they're, they're, they're saying, hey, I want to be out, like I'm willing to put my money in here, but I want to be out first. Um, and, so and so, but the earlier you're in, the more risk you're taking, and so usually you're last in line. Um, at, you know, so if you're a seed investor or you're a series A investor and so forth, you're, you're last in line, but your upside's probably going to be pretty big because your valuations are so low. Yes, so they will um, they will be defined as as either preferential, right, and in priority, or they will in some cases the the um, 
investors can actually all agree to say, that, hey, look, we're all, we're all agreeing that we're going to be paid per pursu, which is basically all equally pro rata based on, our, based on what we've put in to the company. Um, but however that's set up in the beginning of the company's life usually sticks with that company f over the rest of its life. So if, you're, if, you're, if you set it up as, as uh, peri pursu in the beginning, it, it would be peri pursu. Most likely that would continue on through. Yeah, great question. Anybody else? Okay. So, um, so as I said before, we spend a lot of time thinking about um, trends and valuations. What are, what's happening? Are we, you know, are we headed towards a, a, a cliff or a bubble, right? Are we, um, what's, uh, you know, are we seeing patterns in how investors are investing in, um, in companies at different stages? And so we wanted to share some of this information um, that we've come up with with you. And, and this is um, what, what this is, is a, uh, it, we're, this is a look at series seed companies, so seed stage companies, going back about five years, looking at um, how much, typically how much uh, a seed round, how much money is raised in a seed round, and how much of the company is given up in that round, right? So, and, and the, the way that these box plots work is that the dot, the, 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 um, the dots at the top and the bottom are kind of the, 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 the end points. Those are the, is that me buzzing? Okay, I didn't know if that was like a thing up here. Okay, anyway, the, 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 the 90, um, sometimes I buzz like I have, so my chip in my, my head starts to buzz and it makes noise. Um, so um, so th this, is the, uh, th this is kind of like confidence intervals, right? So 5% to 95%, this is saying that you know, most companies in between these are, are in between these dots. Um, within that range, the bulk, the middle half is actually inside the shaded box, right? The middle 50%. And, um, and the dots, which actually are, are not uh, actually shown on this, uh, on this display, are the median. So when we, send the, when we send the printed one out to you, or not the printed one, but when we send the actual electronic version of this out afterwards, you'll see the median dots show up, but the points are here. So what this is saying here is that, um, is that the, median, the median seed round in 2014 was about a, was a $2.1 million raise on a $6.5 million pre-money valuation, and roughly a quarter of the company was given up in the round. And, um, and what we're seeing is that, is that over time, right, you're starting to see, if you see this sort of downward slope on the percentages, downward to flat, with the, and, and yet the, the, uh, the amounts, the raise amounts going up and to the right for the most part, and also the valuation amounts going up and to the right for the most part, is, that's indicative of, of, of a growth period, of a boom period that we're in right now, right, at least within venture. And so, so companies are actually raising more money uh, than they had historically. They're doing so at higher valuations than they had historically, and of course giving up, as, uh, in, uh, giving up less of the company in the process. Um, and that's, that's great news for entrepreneurs. It's actually pretty good news, it's still okay news for investors, but uh, because they're banking on the fact that this is gonna be worth so much more later that they're, you know, they're willing to make those, those trade-offs on valuation in the terms. Um, Here's a look at Series A investments, and again, uh, for those folks who are who are for, um, voraciously, you know, taking notes, I, I will send this out. But you've got you've got uh, about uh, you know a big jump in Series A uh, amounts raised, eight million up from up from the mid fives um, uh, in in twenty fourteen, eight million on a sixteen million dollar, roughly a sixteen million dollar pre money. Yes. Prior, yes. Right, it's equity. It's equity. And I will say that the convertible debt, if, if some folks are, have raised a convertible note, um, by, the time, the, by the time they raise their seed round, right, it will have convert, usually it typically converts into the seed. You know, the, note, the interest, the, the, the principal of that note plus all the interest it accumulates converts into the institutional seed round, or the A if, it, if they skip the seed and go straight to an A round. That's in here. So the 2 1 would include the convertible. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
So, for, so in the two example, right, you might have a 500K convertible note and then raise a $1.5 million seed round. It all converts. Now it looks like a $2 million seed round, right? Plus or minus some interest in there and stuff. Um, so on the Series A companies, um, again, similar patterns. We're starting to see you know, a slight dip in how much is given up in the round, about uh, you know, just under a third of the company is typically given up. Um, but the valuations, of course, the amounts and valuations are, are bumping, bumping way up, right? And we expect this to be, this trend to continue in 2015. We haven't seen, we, not only have we not seen a slowdown, we've actually seen probably an uptick in, upswing in the valuations across tech and so forth in the first half of the year. I mean, I would guess that this, this percentage ownership is probably going to stay fairly flat, you know, flat. fairly flat. Um, but, uh, but I think that I would suspect that these numbers, the, the 8 and the 16, bump up a bit, right? The companies are raising more money um, at higher valuations. And even if it stays, even if it stayed pretty flat at 8, uh, I would still expect this one to go up, right? And so, and so that would change some, some of this. So you could see it, you could see a down dip. We don't have the, I don't think we'll have the 2015 data, full year 2015 data ready until Q1 of 16, right? So, um, yes? Great question, and no. Yeah. It's in this round. Okay. It's in this round. So you so you'll give up a full third of the company at your A. So the remember that's the, so the so the pie is getting bigger, okay. right? Um, but you're so, and it's, so you're getting the folks are getting diluted, but it's it, you have a smaller portion of a bigger of a bigger pie as your valuation increases from your seed round up to your A round, right? You're going to give up a third, but there's another there's a whole another third that's been created created in your valuation itself. If you know what I mean, right? So this isn't cumulative. It's a good question. Um, series B. Um, so this is again um, <clears throat> sort of the trend we're seeing. About about a quarter of the company is typically given up. Um, we're talking about you know in 2014, 12 million on about a 37 million dollar pre-money valuation for a Series B company. So B rounds are actually getting you know we're seeing a lot of I mean B rounds I think um, are are. Uh, that's really the, I think, the, one of the trickiest transitions is from series, uh, series A over to your Series B. Um, but these rounds are pretty substantial because this is typically when businesses are really kind of blowing out their sales and marketing teams. They're really, there's a costly component of the business that they're layering in, but there's a lot of ROI there too. So there's a, um, this is sort of expansion stage here. And, um, and then this is a little bit of a makeup, of sort of a, a snapshot at the makeup of, of the option pool, right? And so, uh, so typically, um, uh, what, you know, one of the questions that was asked of us um, at a different accelerator was, hey, how much should I expect to have to reserve on the side for my employees um, to set aside for options? How much of the ownership of the company should I set aside for the option pool? And so we looked at all of our data on, you know, the size of option pools over time and so forth. And you know, it's obviously it's clustered pretty pretty tightly around this sort of 10 to 20 percent range, and the 10 to 20 percent actually stays that stays true as the company grows and matures and raises more money. So you can think it's it, you might after your Series A, for example, it's it's set at 15, let's say 15 percent. Um, when you you're going to issue some options to your employees, and then when you raise your Series B round, you're going to refresh that option pool back up to 15 percent after the series, you know. As, as, as part of that whole Series B uh, process. So um, this just kind of gives folks a, an idea of where, how most, most tech companies, uh, how, how much they set aside for, for employees there. And, um, and this last section is uh, on equity compensation. You know, we had some folks who have said, okay, well, you know, I just want to know if, if I'm a founder, if I'm a founder and I uh, anticipate that 
my company is going to grow, and at the end of the day, I'm going to have to go hire an actual expert CEO, come, you know, a professional CEO who's serial CEO to come in and manage the business. So think like, you know, Larry Page and Sergey Brin did with, with the, when they brought in Eric. Um, uh, why am I blanking? Eric, Eric, who's the first to get it? Eric? Yes. Sure. Um, and so when you bring in Eric, um, you would expect that, um, that the ownership percentage that you would have to give up, this is again of a fully funded company, right? The ownership percentage would be in that 5% range, right? So founder CEOs who start from the very beginning, those folks are not necessarily, those folks are gonna own a much larger percentage um, than, than a, a CEO, a professional CEO that's brought in later. But a professional CEO that's gonna run the business, that's gonna, you're trying to hire a rock star, they would expect to be typically in that about 5% range and be kept at that 5% range you know, as you, go, as you go forward, as they get near an exit and, and, and so forth. So um, when it's, again, these are fully funded companies um, at sort of the, the, the very, very top of the, of the org chart. Um, you know, uh, and again, you're talking about 5% for the CEO, you maybe 1.5% or so for the COO, CFO. Those percentages are actually very low for, um, these, are, these percentages are low compared to what you would do to bring in your first 10, 20 employees. Right, the, those 10 and 20 employees, if they were to stay over time and all the way through in the business and mature with the business and eventually become these folks, um, after all the rounds have been raised and so forth, they will have been diluted and compressed down into um, these percentages on average, right? And so that's where you just, you know, um, we're actually working with the folks who actually uh, provided some of this data to us to get a better idea of, okay, but what does it look like for the first 10 employees? Like, how should I think about, you know, do I issue, do I issue my employees, um, I, I, I want them to be attractive, but uh, I, want, I want to be attractive to those employees, but I also don't want to be, um, you know, giving to, away too much of the company because it's going to either put me in a bind or it's going to mean I don't have enough, enough uh, stock to issue to other, and attract other, other shareholders, uh, other employees later on. So... Um, here's a, just a look uh, a little bit deeper down into the org chart. Um, so you'll have like sales and marketing, biz dev. Now you're starting to talk about, you know, 90 basis points, 50 basis points, and so forth. Um, you know, we, I would say that, um, you know, there, there are, before you start to, when you're, when you're at the point where you're thinking about, okay, it's time to issue, it's, I've raised money or I'm about to raise money, I'm at a point where I, I want to issue stock or, um, to my employees, you can work with, there are, there are folks out there and we can help you put you in touch with them who are um, equity compensation specialists who can tell you how to, mat, how to ensure that you have the right makeup of your, of your cap table um, and that will position you for future growth. We had a handful of clients that have come to us who have said, you know, as, as part of doing their valuation work, they come to us and they say, well, you know, look, our, our cap table is a disaster. And we said, we looked at it and we were like, it's absolutely a disaster. It's, this is one of the worst cap tables that I've seen. <laughs> and what, they, um, what we found is that um, they didn't set it up right in the beginning, and it actually was a deterrent to investors subsequent later on, because they said, look, it's, it's such a mess. You've got people owning, you've got key people with too little ownership. You've got your legacy early investors who are not willing to cave here, and they're not willing to give up more, give more shares to your key employees. There's too much risk that these guys are eventually just going to say, I'm, "I'm just going to go start it, do something else," and so getting that right in the beginning can have can be hugely beneficial. Um, uh, I just want to know what are the need is consistently higher than the need that does it mean that there's a long tail for all the positions? It means there's probably a, you know there's probably some outliers in those in that set, right? That are driving that that are driving those. So you might have some some folks in there who are. You know, enough folks who are, who are way up, up in the high end of the range that are dragging that, that average up. Any questions on this? Again, happy to, to share a, a more legible version of this with you guys uh, electronically, so. Uh, and this is, again, this is um, sort of a, just kind of a rundown of, of some of the, um, you know, some of the key hires and you know, the concept that, that, again, your early stage employees are, are your very early employees are going to 
are going to seemingly own a, a fair amount of the company, um, you know, when they're, when you're setting up the company. But again, over time, they're going to be they they will be diluted. And messaging that dilution is not a bad thing, entirely a bad thing, is a, is important. Um, because again, if, if some folks are very concerned about you know, well, I had I had five percent or seven percent or whatever. Now I own three percent. You know, they, there's that can be a tough conversation to have, but it's three percent of a much bigger number, and so that's really what's important to address there. Okay. Well, you guys, thank you, thank you. You guys benefited because I, I decided not to have the psych glass coffee beforehand, in which case I would have finished this whole thing in five minutes. So I, don't, I don't know if that's actually a benefit or a, um, but. Um, any, any questions on this that I can help answer here? Um, uh, if there aren't, um, and folks have questions after I send the deck out, um, feel free to contact me. Um, and um, for, fo for those of you in the room uh, who haven't met Regina, um, so please reach out to Regina as well. She's a resource locally here in, 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 in Galvanize. Um, we can all sort of connect and, and figure out a way to, to help answer your questions. Um, I, I'm also gonna stick around for a bit now too if people have questions too. So thank you for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>